Good evening and welcome to the penultimate week of UCLA's fall quarter and the second to last gathering of 10 questions, if not now, when? I'm Vic Marks. Tonight, as we ask the question, how do we sustain? I'm considering how it is that we sustain ourselves during these fast moving quarters. A moment ago, there were midterms and now suddenly we are nearly at the end. Whether it's the swift sprint of a quarter or the slow weightiness of a pandemic, my first thought is that in this instance, sustaining requires nourishment. Not only the nourishment of food, but of the spirit. What resources do we need to sustain? To not just survive, but to thrive. What keeps you going right now, whether you're a student or not? What keeps you going? Please reach for your keyboard and share with us in the chat what sustains you? My family, family. Knowing that hard work will pay off. Family, wow, a friends. Music and art. Hope. Please keep them coming. We're here for a while together tonight. Throughout 10 questions, our weekly queries have toggled us between an individual and personal application of the question, how do I connect? How do I remember? How do I heal? And so on. And then larger collective applications of the questions. How do we connect? How do we remember? How do we heal? because I am, and you are, always part of some, something much bigger than ourselves. So as we turn to the question, how do we sustain? I'm thinking about how we sustain one another, a shared idea or project, how we sustain one another at work, in our education, in our families, amongst friends. It is a bumpy, road life. And while each of us has our own experience, beginnings and endings, we're in this together. Back to 10 questions. Anne-Marie Burke and I work together in selecting this fall's questions with the deliberate intent of eliciting ongoing consideration and understanding of three urgent collective and individual concerns, social justice, climate change, and well-being. Like three different melodies, we have worked to sustain these themes, developing and entwining them with each other as we have collectively moved forward. Perhaps there are other themes that you feel we have sustained this fall or ways in which these gatherings have moved you. If you feel so inclined, please share with us in the chat other themes that have wended their way through our weeks together. Oh, resilience, thank you for that. And so connected. Keep them coming but I wanna share something else. In addition, through 10 questions, we have sought to sustain a story about ourselves collectively. We began by asking who we are, both complicating we-ness, we-ness, while also gathering as a consenting coalition of different individuals with different life experiences in order to move forward. With your permission, as a we, we asked how to begin, how to return to campus, to work, and to begin again with what we've learned from our loss and isolation. 
And then in beginning, we asked how to connect because connecting is a necessity. We considered the stories that have yet to be told about ourselves, the invitation to step towards one another openly and with healthy vulnerability. In connecting, we reflected on the need to remember our histories, the stories about ourselves and one another that have been suppressed and that are needed in order to heal. And we asked, how do we heal? And we remembered music and the need to lift up one another, especially in the face of discrimination. And we were reminded of the many ways of healing, vast archives of knowledge that lie beyond Western medicine. And because there is so much healing to do, we asked about failure. We affirmed the need to take risks, to expand the grace of failure and the opportunities it opens up evenly to us all. We were reminded that life is not a report card. And the story continued. We asked, how do we change? In this, we thought about ourselves as change agents, not spectators, but doers. We considered the value of shifting our assumptions and our habits of thought in order to find creative solutions for problems. Remember Professor Kelly Turner's pivot to think of heat as pollution and to ask if protection from too much heat is a civil right. And we danced, not simply to be happy, which is quite good enough as is, but to claim our vitality and our very own lives. And as we were changing, we were building. We are building. We are adapting and transforming in response to climate change, culture change. And we are working together because some things, things worth doing, necessary things require all of us to build. And so here we are. We've told a story this quarter about ourselves, for ourselves, a kind of proposal for continuing. And a story like a house or a structure is a way to hold and sustain a set of experiences that unfold one after the other and mingle with each other. We have shared meals together, so to speak. And so it is that right here in 10 Questions, we sustain. In our way, in keeping with the ritual of 10 Questions, we move on to presentations by tonight's three extraordinary guests, Kara Horowitz, Arturo O'Farrell, and Dr. Drea Letamendi. Their presentations, Provocations, really, in response to how do we sustain, will be followed by some very special excerpts of student work made specifically in response to the question, how do we fail? After viewing this work, we will return to a discussion and Q&A with our guests and then close out the evening. So off we go. Kara Horowitz is the co-executive director of the Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at UCLA School of Law, where she also co-directs the Environmental Law Clinic. The Emmett Institute, founded as the first law school center in the nation, focuses on climate change law and policy. Through her teaching and research, Kara helps to advance innovative research, public policy debate, and legislative reform to address climate change and its devastating effects. Prior to joining UCLA, Kara worked in the private sector and for the Natural Resources Defense Council, where she litigated high profile cases and advocated domestically and internationally to protect oceans and wildlife. Welcome, Kara. Thank you so much, Vic. And thank you for having me. It's really fantastic to be here tonight and to spend a little of our evening together. 
Um, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about how I got into this work. Um, the photo that you see on the slide in front of you of the little house is the Girl Scout house in New Rochelle, New York, my hometown. New Rochelle is most famous as the home of Thomas Paine, one of our founding fathers and the author of Common Sense. Um, I was a Girl Scout in this house and like Girl Scouts, I sold Girl Scout cookies. And one year I sold more of them than any other person in my troop and I got a prize. And the prize I got was this book that's also pictured on the slide called Scenic Wonders of America. Um, it has gorgeous pictures of landscapes across the United States. I was a little girl in suburban New York who had never seen anything like the places pictured in the book. And of course I immediately fell in love with them and fell in love with the idea of visiting them and even more so with the idea of continuing to conserve them for future generations. Um, at about the same time, I also did a science project for school that looked into the effects of acid rain on um, lakes and little ponds in my neighborhood, including the little pond that sits right behind this little white house. And I was horrified by the idea that, first of all, there was this thing called acid rain, and then it was falling on our communities and harming our neighborhoods and the places that I really loved. And it was these uh, formative experiences ultimately that I think led me to go to law school and to learn about environmental protection and to understand how to advance environmental protection through the law. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and ask you guys a question in the chat. Um, if you think of yourself as a person who also cares about climate change, I'm curious, what are some of the things you're worried about losing? Or conversely, what would you be most excited to protect from climate change if you could? And your answers can really be anything. They can be values, they can be people, they can be activities, um, they can be whatever is closest to your heart. Thanks for sharing. So next slide, please. I started my legal career in the same way in some ways that the environmental movement itself began by working on issues of local pollution. I worked for a nonprofit, as Vic said, called NRDC. I worked on ocean and wildlife issues, doing really traditional conservation advocacy, including through litigation. The explosion of environmental law in the United States in the early 1970s was developed to deal with traditional environmental problems like local air pollution and local water pollution. And it's hard to imagine today, but the field really was developed with bipartisan support, with support from Republicans and Democrats. And this was true in part because of the characteristics of local air and water pollution that make them hard to ignore. And I'm gonna contrast this with climate change in a second. This is why I'm, I'm interested in thinking about these kinds of traditional environmental pollution problems. Often they are local, they affect where we live, they're palpable, you can feel them and see them directly. They're quick acting. So there often isn't a lot of lag time between the emission of the pollution on the one hand and feeling the effects on the other. And crucially, often they can be solved regionally or locally. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. It's up on the screen. It's the burning of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. I don't know if any of you live close to this river or have lived close to it. Um, oil slicks and flammable pollutants in the river caused so many high profile fires and so frequently in the 50s and 60s that local officials installed permanent metal signs along the river declaring it flammable. And you can see that on the slide too, which I just find remarkable. These kinds of events outraged a nation and they gave rise to laws like the Clean Water Act and working on these kinds of local problems seems doable, right? Not easy, but if you were to prevent pollutants from flowing down the river from a finite set of upstream sources, you could keep this river from lighting on fire. And in fact, that's what we've done through the decades. Again, it's not easy, but it's the idea of this kind of work is not intellectually overwhelming. Um, next slide. And of course, I'm talking about this in part to contrast it with climate change. Part of why climate advocacy is hard 
stems from how different the problem of climate change really is from the problem of traditional environmental pollution. Um, as noted on the slide, greenhouse gases are invisible, they're odorless, climate change is slower acting, that is there's more of a lag time between the emissions on the one hand and when you feel the worst effects of those emissions, that lag time could be measured in generations. Climate change problems result from emissions from just countless sources dispersed globally and local impacts of climate change really don't depend on local levels of emission. So no single jurisdiction can solve the problem on its own. Instead, it requires massive cooperation of an unpre unprecedented scale. So it's pretty daunting. Um, not all of these problems though are intractable. So on the slide, you see two dramatic and pretty creative attempts to get around some of these problems. Both of these were staged in the lead up to one of the big annual UN climate conferences. On the right, you see cabinet members from the Maldives nation holding a climate change meeting underwater. And on the left, activists have filled a balloon to represent visually, physically, the size of one ton of CO2. Both of these photos show folks trying hard to make climate change feel real and palpable and urgent. Next slide. Um, this next slide actually shows my favorite ever effort to overcome some of these difficulties, and it's through art. This is a picture that I took in Paris in 2015 when I was there along with negotiators and advocates from around the globe for the meeting that gave rise to the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, and what you're seeing is a photo of one of 12 icebergs that were brought to Paris from Greenland and arranged like a clock face around a Parisian street. The installation is called Ice Watch. It was the work of Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson and a geologist. And the piece is really trying to overcome this sense that climate change is happening someplace far away. Um, and it's doing it by bringing the ice to you and letting you watch it melt right in front of you. And it was placed in Paris so that negotiators working on the Paris Agreement would feel and see the ice melting on the street below them literally as they negotiated. Um, importantly, like this installation itself, the Paris Agreement is an attempt to get over around some of the hurdles of working on climate change as a problem. By giving countries assurances that if they take steps to tackle the problem of climate change, they won't be doing so alone. They'll be doing so in partnership with other countries doing the same thing. Through the Paris Agreement and other more regional and local efforts, including notably some really outstanding leadership um, here in Los Angeles and in California on climate change, we have started to make some progress on this issue. I wanna be clear, so far our efforts are too slow. They're not yet sufficient to meet the moment, but I think we're headed in the right direction. Next slide. So the question really becomes, how do you keep this progress up? How do you sustain it? And how do you accelerate it? What I've learned in my many years working on climate change problems is that many of the characteristics that make climate change a hard problem to solve also make it hard to sustain work as an advocate on the problem. And I've been thinking about this a little bit recently. As climate impacts increase because of wildfires or droughts, increasing storms, floods, extreme heat, the many issues and impacts that I know you guys have talked about through the semester. And as climate change gets closer to our communities and our families and the people we love, more and more people around the world are paying attention. That's a good thing. But the problem still seems too big somehow to solve. People are angry. They wonder if it's even possible to make the kinds of changes on the scale and on the time frame that's necessary. It seems really dire. Folks know that. In fact, it is pretty dire and it feels very overwhelming. And so sometimes it seems to me like we've gone straight from climate denialism to climate doomerism. Um, but we can't give up. So Thomas Paine, the famous resident of New Rochelle once said, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. 
This sentiment may be one reason I think why the message of Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg, who's up on the slide, has really broken through the noise on climate change. I think we increasingly recognize that it is totally unfair that we have foisted this problem on our children, that we have not let them live in peace. It's not fair that children around the world have been forced to be our moral voice on this issue. So I think about this and I know we really have no choice. We have to keep fighting. We have to keep fighting hard. We have to sustain the fight for a long time despite these difficulties. Next slide. So, so I'm gonna leave you with three keys that I've been thinking through myself for sustaining this work, notwithstanding how hard it can sometimes feel. I'd be curious to hear from all of you guys what you think about these approaches. But my three keys, my personal three keys are represented by the photos on this slide, which is my last one. Um, first, I like to focus my work, at least some of the time, on local issues. Though the problem of climate change is global and though the solutions must be systemic, our brains are not wired, I think, to think that big all the time. We have to chip away at smaller aspects of the problem. For me, that means putting down the Twitter feed where everything is you know, a subject of conversation all at once and it can get very overwhelming and focusing on one thing in front of me and focusing on the people in front of me. And I'll give you an example in the environmental law clinic uh, that Vic referenced and that I co-direct. In, in the clinic this past spring, students and I worked with some local LA groups to figure out legal pathways to support LA County's decision to phase out oil and gas extraction from the county. That's a vote that the LA County supervisors then took um, this past fall. The decision to phase out oil and gas in LA County is systemic. It's hugely important. And because it lo it's local, it feels really doable and palpable. My students and I were able to take a hike and see the pump jacks that their advocacy might help to shut down. So that gave the work special meaning. Um, my second key to doing sustainable work is really to bring your whole self to the work um, and allow yourself to have fun with it if you can. If you're passionate about art, do some art. If you're funny, write some jokes. I asked my students in my climate law seminar um, last week to write some haiku about climate change for our last class. Whatever you, you love doing is gonna be the thing that you're able to do consistently even through hard times. And I'm illustrating this point, yes, with a totally gratuitous picture of one of my daughter's most recent pieces of art, which I happen to love because it shows nature and the built environment in harmony. And then my last key is, and this is when I have trouble remembering sometimes, taking time to recharge and reconnect with the things you love in the world that you are fighting for, with the places and the people that motivate you to do the work. So this is why, in part why I asked you that answer, sorry, I asked you that question in the chat earlier. For you, think about the answers you gave in the chat. What do you care most about saving? It's okay, it's good even, to let yourself spend time with the things that you love, just enjoying them. Um, one of my first loves, as I shared, are national parks, going back to my time as a Girl Scout. And so in recent years, I've been very deliberate about taking time to camp with my family in national parks each of the past few summers. We've gone to Yellowstone, we've gone to the Grand Canyon, we've gone to Yosemite, and most recently, I really wanted to see the coastal redwoods in Northern California. And you see that at the bottom, the very, very bottom of a coastal redwood pictured in the third um, photo here. They're the tallest trees in the world. I had never seen one. They're really remarkable. If you've never seen one, I highly recommend it. Doing these things doesn't mean that climate change gets easier to solve. But for me, at least, doing these things means that I am able to fight this fight year after year. And I think the more people who are able to sustain this work year after year, the closer we will get to saving what we can. And that's sort of the best answer I have and the best solution I have to the overwhelming problem of climate change. I'll stop there. I really look forward to, to our conversation. Mm.
Thank you so much, Kara. Um, I don't know why, I just have to say this. I also am a big Girl Scout cookie seller. <laughs> um, and I, I wanna know, um, with your students, were you able to be, you know, was there some success in shutting down the, the, the oil drilling in LA or is that ongoing? Yeah, so I mean, I don't wanna claim this as a success of ours. It's really a result of ongoing coalition work by local advocacy groups in Los Angeles going back, you know, decades. But some of those groups were our clients in the clinic and we did help them think through some of the legal strategies that allowed the LA County supervisors this past September to take the vote that they took. And they voted to begin to phase out, in fact, to phase out over time, oil and gas extraction from LA County land, which was incredible. It's the first big county to do so in the United States. And I think it really signals a shift that we're getting serious about shutting down fossil fuels. Wow, that's, that's extraordinary. It's not extraordinary, but it's incredible. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you one other question. You, you, you brought up sustainability in, um, or sustaining in so many ways, um, sustaining yourself, um, sustaining the work. And I just want to um, ask you if you just help us understand a little bit um, how, how you understand environmental sustainability. What does that mean? It's a really tough concept. Oh. To me, it means figuring out a way to live in community in a way that endures, not just this year and next year, but this generation and next generation in a way that's not overtaxing our resources and robbing future generations of the benefits of this bountiful earth that we have enjoyed for so long. And that's partly how I, I or why I think it's so important to ground my own work in the idea of conserving, conserving for future generations. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, I look forward to our continuing our discussion shortly. Me too. Thanks. Um, now, I'd like to introduce Grammy Award-winning pianist, composer, and educator, Arturo O'Farrell. Arturo was born in Mexico and grew up in New York City. His professional career began with the Carla Bley Band, and he, con I hope I said that right, and he continued as a solo performer with artists including Dizzy Gillespie, Lester Bowie, Wynton Marsalis, and Harry Belafonte. In 2007, he founded the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance as a not-for-profit organization dedicated to the performance, education, and preservation of Afro-Latin music. An avid supporter of all the arts, Arturo has performed with Ballet Hispanico and made work for other world-renowned dance companies. Arturo joined the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music in 2019 and currently serves as the school's Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Welcome, Arturo. Thank you, Vic. It's a privilege to be here and to hear such uh, innovative thinking about what it means to sustain. And what I did is I looked at this thing. Uh, I was thinking about there is a catch all word for all the different things that we want to sustain, all the different things that we want to sustain. And I think the word for me naturally, because I'm a musician, is the word groove. So I came up with the idea of how do we sustain the groove? But it came from a very specific, very specific situation that. Uh, was born uh, during the pandemic in which a lot of the folks that I love and work with, uh, wait staff, musicians, front of house people, sound engineers were all, all of a sudden out of work. And so it brought to mind something that I used to, I used to periodically ask my kids, they're both musicians, I'd yell at them, I'd say, what's more important than the groove? And they'd look it up at me with fear and go, nothing, dad. <laughs> so to me, the groove is a catch-all phrase for all the things that we want to try and continue. Uh, and so if you'd like, we can go to the slides now, to the presentation, and I'll be happy to uh, talk about how do we sustain, literally or theoretically? What does that mean? Well, what is it? The next slide is good. This is uh, a gentleman who I'm sure you'll recognize uh, right away. 
I'll go ahead, we can go on to the next slide. This is part of a campaign that I created called Sustain the Groove, in which we got uh, friends from throughout the world to uh, advocate, uh, uh, to advocate to take part in our Sustain the Groove campaign. The Afro-Lad Jazz Alliance uh, created an emergency artist fund. And we were literally to raise $110,000 that they gave out of $200, $500 grants to freelance artists, not just musicians, by the way. We actually gave uh, grants to uh, uh, performance artists, uh, uh, even stand-up comedians. And so what I did is I got my dear friend, Dr. Cornell West, to uh, uh, go ahead and help us understand why it's so important to stay in the group. And I, as I asked my kids, as they were growing up, I asked Dr. West, what is more important than the groove? You may turn on that slide. What is more important than the groove on the 53rd anniversary of the death of John Coltrane? There's my mama my loved ones but in the end the funk and the groove ain't got nothing more important because it's about the love unadulterated unstoppable love so that made me realize that um there was there what 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 do we sustain exactly what is the group and how do you find your groove? And how do you understand your place within the body of, of others or other, of the work that, of others? So here's what I came up with. I came up with that in order to sustain, we have to have two tracks. We have to understand our larger selves so that we're not waylaid by the day-to-day -day activities. That We have to keep our eye on the prize as you've heard so many times. Uh, what is the groove? Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, what is more important than what is the groove? What is it? What is the groove exactly? For you, for me, uh, the groove took place, it, it began to reveal itself to me after I was already successful as a musician because I was successful but wasn't happy. And what I realized is there was a larger sense to me than just making music, just playing notes. It was something bigger. So I started to get this larger sense of myself and what this groove really was. And so I created two conversations with myself that I think are lifelong groove lessons. The first one is what is really important to me is about connecting conviction to your craft, connecting social cause to your craft, connecting uh, uh, some sort of, of positive uh, contribution to your community to whatever you do. That's really important to me. This big part of my groove. The second big part of my groove is, is a little more personal. I also wanna ask the cultural question, who gets to seat at, who gets to sit at the table of culture? Who gets to sit at the discussion of what music is, what culture is, what art is, and why are some people excluded from that table and other people are not? You can move on to the next slide. So the groove is forward motion, smooth continuing. The ability to see yourself as part of the ability to understand what others do. And that's really simple. Um, when I say forward motion, I mean, you have to have, as I said, a larger arc and you have to be able to look forward to what you really want to accomplish, not just the exact details of what you are, what you do, but what is your larger purpose? My American history teacher in college is now a distinguished professor at UCLA who has just retired. Teofilo Ruiz was the first person to say to me, why are you a musician? And it really made me angry. He said, why am I a musician? Why am I a musician? And he really kind of got me thinking about the large art and he began to uncover this thing that is an important part of my message. When I say smooth continuum, I will explain a little later that in order to be really functional and really sustain your grief, you have to know what, how to smooth it out. And I'll explain that musically in a minute. Also, the other part of sustaining groove for me is to be able to see myself in the horizontal as part of the continuum, to be able to see uh, uh, a lot of people on the same arc as I am. I also need to be able to hear what other people do, what others do. This is the, the what other people hear, what other people think, what other people say. We can move on because I'll explain it better this way. Okay, don't play this yet. Picadillo is a composition by Tito Puente. And there's, I'm going to draw your attention to four parts of it. And I'm going to hope you can hear. The first thing that you hear that is part of the groove of Picadillo is called the clave. And it's very simple. It goes like this. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, 
two, three. Very simple, very simple. Now, the second part, the part that is played on the conga drums is called the tumbao. And it's also very simple. It's, uh, it goes like this, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Four and one and two and three and 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 four and and then there's a third layer called the cascara. The cascara goes like this. Right? And then a guido part, which is just kind of goes, it sounds like papaya, 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 papaya. So I want to play this for you, but I want you to start to think, and I'm going to try and I'm know the latency problems in uh in zoom but i'll try and and display each layer so you can see that without being aware of everybody's layers without being aware of one another's work without being aware of yourself as part of a larger entity you simply lose your groove you can play this piece now one two one two three And then the Guido. And here in the bell. So this piece would never work. The thing that I love about being a musician is that if it's about me, if it's about my part, if it's about me, if it's about my part, the thing that I love about being a musician is it's just about me, then it doesn't groove. It can only groove when I become incredibly aware of what you're doing, what you're what you're playing, and what your role is in connection to mine. Some things that I, I realized, uh, the groove is volitional. One chooses to act. The groove is when you make a decision to put yourself forward and to give of yourself. The other part of the groove that I realized, and I'll explain that in a minute, is that one does not wait for an invitation. You do not wait for the cue. You jump in with both feet. The other part of the groove that I think is important is to be surrounded. You surround yourself with others who think like you, who want to change the world, who want to make this a better place. Let's move on because I, I can see that I'm running out of time. So how do I sustain the groove? I was born in Mexico City. I came to the United States when I was six years old, and I was most certainly the only Mexican in my immediate uh, area. Uh, but I love to play music. My father gave me piano lessons, and I became a pianist. Um, I loved Herbie Hancock, and I discovered that music. And then I was discovered by Carla Blay, and I was, uh, you know, soon I found myself to her. I thought all these things would make me happy, man. But I wasn't happy. I was eking out a living, as a matter of fact. And then all of a sudden, I became successful. I started an orchestra at Jazz at Lincoln Center. I got a Grammy. I got this notoriety. But I still wasn't happy. I wasn't marrying my conviction and what I, that larger arc about uh, the cultural conversation, that larger arc about seeing uh, equity uh, distribution about, uh, to people. I still wasn't connecting any of my conviction with my art. And then I started something called the Afroland Jazz Alliance, which I call my greatest composition. The Afroland Jazz Alliance, and you can click on that on that just to quickly, briefly look at uh, what it is. It's the nonprofit that I created. The nonprofit serves as an education, performance, and cultural preservation entity. Um, you can just scroll in anywhere. You can go into uh, about Alja or this is what we're doing. We raise money. We started with a budget of $40,000. Two years ago before the pandemic, our budget was $2.1 million. And this is what we do with that money. We buy instruments to give to kids in marginalized New York City schools. And then we send teaching artists from the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra and all our friends to go into those schools and give lessons ensemble experience and theory lessons. Then we also have a pre-professional training program in which the, we get kids to by audition from all over the city come together and, uh, and, uh, and perform the music of the masters. Um, we've seen lives change. We also, we also support the work of the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra and our touring performing work, our recording work. We also have a, a library, a cultural, treasure of us parts and scores and memorabilia we can move on from this um so in some ways it began very simply 
I had no idea what I was doing. I had no clue whatsoever. My wife and I taped music on the kitchen table and we had, I, I just knew I had to do something, volition. I said, I gotta do something to change the course of the cultural conversation. And so we created this thing. I asked a couple of my friends to teach. I didn't wait for an invitation. And uh, during the pandemic, we were putting together a weekly stream. This week will be week 83 of a stream that uh, we put out that uh, also continues to raise funds for the, uh, for the Emergency Artist Fund and for the work of the Afro-Land Jazz Alliance. This is an example of a YouTube that involves people playing from throughout the world. Okay, you're gonna see quickly uh, musicians in Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, Paris, London, and my orchestra all playing together. And this, this, is, this, this guitarist is in Abu Dhabi. The bass player is in Brooklyn. The percussionists are in Kuwait and the orchestra is scattered between the United States and Europe. <laughs> Now, um, the thing about all of it, all of it, is that it, it's led to a momentous thing. So I began by playing the piano. I began with a larger arc of understanding who I was. It's led to a partnership with New York City, a contractor named Lega, and a, Lantern, and a community service organization called Lantern and the Afro-Land Jazz Lines. We are building a 19-story affordable housing in the heart of Spanish. Harlem, and we're creating the Afro-Latin Music and Arts Center, which is an arts and community center. This is what sustaining the groove is to me. This is connected my convictions, my need to see social and economic equity. This is my need to see uh, car the, ar the artifice of elitism destroyed. And finally, the cultural table be made open to all. And so I will close with this last little clip. This is what I do. Uh, we can move on. This is why I do what I do this last little bit. So this is from one of our teaching artists. These are kids in, in, in the heart of the South Bronx. But this is why I grew. This is why I do what I do. These kids are taught by our teaching artists. And it brings, it brings me so much joy to know that my life, my group, has brought instruments and music making into the hearts of otherwise marginalized children. This is why I sustain the group. This is what the group is to me. And I thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Arturo, thank you. Um, music is incredible. Um, I, yeah, it's just so amazing. Um, I think it's also great for us to remember that success, which you had early on, multiple successes, that actually like really finding your groove is something that came a little later, right? Or like the yeah, groove that I mean, mattered. I, 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 really, I really found that uh, being able to play the piano, I thought was gonna bring me success, being able to tour, being able to make a living, starting a family, all these things I thought were gonna bring me happiness, but what really brings me happiness is seeing opportunities. What really creates my group is to see opportunities extended to those who don't have them. And you know, I wanted to also ask you a, a, a question. Um, not only are you an extraordinary musician, but your father is or was also, Chico O'Farrell was also a musician. And I think you've just uh, kind of hinted that your sons are musicians. And I, I wonder if you could just take just a brief moment to talk to us about sustaining um, tradition through music. Yeah, it's funny, my, we're just celebrating the centennial of Chico Farrell. <laughs> and my sons have both uh, grabbed onto the sickness of being musicians, unfortunately. But it's the, here's how you sustain the tradition 
should be a thing of joy. It should not be a job. It should not be a forced uh, 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 occupation. And what happened is my father showed me the incredible satisfaction that he got from bringing his craft to the world. And so, you know, I guess we could have been plumbers or accountants and we were following in, in the footsteps. But what really happened is that this tradition of making music, which by the way, in Latin American households, is very often some of the groups that like the Muñequitos de Matanzas are, are generations of people that have been doing it for 50, 60 years. But I think the best I can say is that music is a sacred altar, which you use to serve people with. You serve others. And that to me is the real tradition. The real tradition is not making notes and getting applause. The real tradition is taking and giving back and serving others. That's what art is. That's what it should be. And in, in its best in, in its best examples, that's what it is. Thank you so much, Arturo. We'll continue this in a moment. Um, now I'd like to make a shift and introduce Dr. Drea Ledamendi, um, who is a licensed clinical psychologist, professor, and mental health consultant. Dr. Letamendi currently serves as the Associate, Associate Director of Mental Health for Residential Life and the Interim Director of the UCLA Resilience Center, known as RISE, where her work with college students, faculty, and professionals focuses on resilience building, crisis response, and suicide prevention. She's the designated psychological consultant for media companies, fandom and screen junkies, and has consulted with Marvel DC and other pop culture franchises on topics related to mental health representation on screen. Her TEDx talk, Capes, Cowls and Courage, explores her personal story overcoming imposter syndrome and discovering resilience and more recently, as part of a special COVID-19 series called Conversations with Ted, she presented her thoughts on resilience and media during a pandemic. Welcome, Drea. Thank you so much for having me at this very important conversation. Um, I am just so uh, thrilled to be at this table I'm so excited and privileged to have a seat at this table. And I also want to thank Kara uh, uh, and Arturo for sharing their thoughts so far. Um, I have to admit that I'm experiencing a little bit of imposter syndrome just having this seat tonight. And um, it is such a thrill to be here. And I will hopefully contribute to this co amazing conversation we're having about sustaining. Um, and when I think about how we sustain, I invite and welcome folks to imagine and consider what it is that we're holding on to. What are we sustaining? And what does it mean to sustain? Sustaining is what? Is it existing? Is it being? Um, I would propose and even and suggest that sustaining is mattering. It's belonging. It's purpose. Uh, we're not just holding on to the status quo we're trying to, or trying to bring the past back or, or, you know, if we're thinking about this pandemic and where we're at with this pandemic, we're, we're really emerging with such amazing insights and with a sense of resilience. And so here, you know, I know with mental health, we could talk about so much. So here, I really want to focus on three areas on raising consciousness, resilience, and purpose, especially during a crisis or coming out of a crisis. And in particular, how can that sustainability be mediated? So that's probably the central and my biggest provocation, Vic, is can sustainability be mediated and how? Um, and it's important, you know, as we have this conversation to take a step back and, and ask, you know, why is this important now? Of course, mental health is always important. I'll say that as a psychologist, as someone who works at, in higher education at a university who works with numerous young people um, and folks of all ages around how we're sustaining our well being. Um, I want to name some things that I think are helpful just in kind of grounding ourselves around where we're at in this crisis. We spent a long time essentially preparing for a phobia. We've been forming all these strategies to protect our bodies, right? And those strategies involved all these things that 
were helpful toward our physical health, but actually were um, actually not helpful, maladaptive, and, and even put our mental health at risk. If we think about isolating ourselves and um, stepping away from social gatherings, not hugging our family members, grandparents, you know, I'm sure we can all list multiple things that we wanted to do, but had to hold back and limit ourselves around. And I want to say that as we're re-emerging and beginning to form those social relationships and those, those interactions again, um, it's, a, it's a hard time. It's not easy. And as a psychologist, I'll say that, you know, of course, not everyone needs therapy, but most of us are managing some level of stress, burnout, relationship difficulties, challenging situations. Um, we're in a recovery. And that's what I want to name. I will say just in, in the domain of higher education that counseling centers and universities are seeing a rise in student stress, in anxiety, in particular disorders like eating disorders, um, suicidal ideation, depression. And we are, we are seeing some of that acuity uh, become more present. Um, I really think that another way to look at this too is the mental health literacy of young generations and our students acknowledging that they need support. And I think that's a positive spin on that. And yet, you know, to our audience today and to our speakers, I want to name that we are continuing to see great harm happen in our community. Just Friday, the verdict of um, Kyle Rittenhouse, this young white man who murdered two protesters or two persons who were at a Black, Matter, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protest um, was found not guilty on all charges. And while this is not a, a comment about politics, I want to name that these types of harms continue to impact us on many, many levels. In a way, um, you know, in continuation of naming those stressors, we've experienced many types of stressors that are, I think, are important to acknowledge. Um, as human beings, we're actually the most familiar with acute stress. These are the um, what we call normal stressful events: uh, an exam, a, a talk, uh, you know, something that that creates a, a motivation to energize ourselves, and and our bodies are quite equipped for that. Chronic stress is an emotional pressure over a long period of time. And that's what this pandemic has introduced to us in terms of our mental health. I also acknowledge that we will be experiencing echo pandemics for the next five to 10 years. As a mental health professional, what that looks like are you know, increased needs and demands around supporting mental health. Um, we also know that uh, there are other echo pandemics. Uh, Kara, I imagine there are, there's a huge impact on um, our global climate as a result, as a ripple effect of uh, the harms of this crisis. Um, Arturo, I imagine that the arts and entertainment have been impacted by this crisis. And so I think all of us can probably name within their industry or field how the pandemic has this ripple effect, our economy, our mental health, our society. Uh, it is likely going to be one of the biggest events in our lifetime and will have a continued impact on us. And so resilience is so important as a conversation piece, right? I think, you know, growing up, a lot of us may have heard the term resilience and it's often referred to as uh, bouncing back. And I have to be quite honest and say, I really dislike that idea. It sounds robotic and automatic. You know, we as humans, we're so complicated and we work so hard that this isn't a natural bouncing back. This is hard work. Um, so I want to reframe that. Resilience is our ability to learn from our mistakes. Uh, resilience is our ability to come back from setbacks and failures, and it requires self-awareness, self-efficacy, and self-compassion. Um, and so here's my ask, you know, can resilience be mediated? And this is uh, the work I've been doing for the last 10 years, drawing from storytelling in our media 
to talk about psychological science, to talk about mental health matters, to encourage us to explore sometimes difficult conversations or topics, um, but with a common theme or through a character or a story or even a TV show or film that we're connected around. I have to say that there is some data that shows that since the pandemic, um, we've seen a, an increased connection to our media and that shouldn't surprise us. We spent a lot of time in lockdowns or in isolation uh, connecting through various platforms and through entertainment and through the arts. Um, and what these studies have found is that uh, not only are folks spending more time with entertainment media in particular, um, but also that um, folks are saying, I look at storytelling differently. Um, some might have gone toward nostalgic entertainment, uh, going back to stories that they knew when, when they were children. And, and some of us, and I fully admit I'm one of these people, we went toward horror, we went toward dystopia, we went toward the storytelling that was tragic and traumatic. We needed that space to explore this, right? Um, and so I'd like to ask the chat, you know, uh, share what types of you know, TV shows, film, um, stories, media, podcasts, was there something that you watched or listened to or connected to over the pandemic that you felt kind of helped you get through it? What kind of media were you connected to? So some folks are saying Discord, podcasts, I'm seeing some platforms here. Um, the next few things I'll talk about, um, and I know podcasts can include fictional storytelling. Uh, I see some folks DMing me with actual shows. Yes, yes, yes. Um, How I Met Your Mother, Ted Lasso. Um, I admit that, you know, as a huge Marvel fan, I was going toward uh, superhero stories uh, in particular. And so, you know, in the last couple of minutes, I, I'll... Um, I'll ask folks to continue to explore what we call mediated resilience. This used to be called parasocial relationships, this idea that these um, mediated representations or these others on screen uh, were uh, connected to us. Um, so for the last 20, 30 years, this has been studied. More recently, of course, during the pandemic, um, psychologists and other mental health practitioners, especially in media psychology, realized that when we were watching these shows, we were feeling less lonely. This is a, a loneliness buffer. Some of us were experiencing uh, cathartic relief. In fact, um, there's, there's work on horror that shows that um, when we watch horror themes on screen, that type of fictional storytelling, um, that that could build resilience because we're sort of practicing these negative emotions. We have the safe space to process that. Um, and so there are a few things that I want to describe more concretely about mediated resilience, in particular storytelling and media. Um, one, it does help us process difficult emotions we may have experienced over the pandemic, grief, anger, hopelessness. Again, this is almost a, a practice of emotion regulation. Um, when we watched WandaVision and heard Vision say, what is grief but love persevering? We got it. We got it. When we watched Lovecraft Country and saw Letty and Atticus and Montrose uh, listen to uh, Shaboom on the radio in the car during 1950s Jim Crow era um, and during horrific racial trauma, that moment that they find joy, we're saying to ourselves, I can experience genuine joy. I can experience radical joy during this these hard times, right? So it invites us to experience joy. It forces us to confront issues that are so important to our survival. Can I say that squid games kind of can creep into that, right? What are the emotions that we feel when we're faced with survival themes? Um, and then, you know, finally, this important stuff about resilience. We are learning self-efficacy by witnessing characters, try solutions, they experience setbacks and they have a willingness to persevere uh, nonetheless. Um, and so 
I will in this last minute then say, as a, you know, a final encouragement around our relationships with media, uh, yes, this can be a positive, healthy relationship when we think about mediated resilience. And again, I'm going back to those three ideas, consciousness, resilience, and purpose. Consciousness referring to um, a return to who we are, preservation of the, of the self, of the personhood. Resilience meaning I, I, can, um, I can approach something. I am willing to endure hardship. And then finally, that meaning and purpose um, I will, I, I will uh, persevere. Um, I will find, as uh, Arturo said, this, you know, I will connect my convictions on these matters that are really important. Uh, and so I'll end with uh, hopefully something that's very empowering that comes from uh, the ending of the show Loki, which I will not spoil for folks, but will say that one of the greatest weapons that we have in this journey is our ability to choose one story over another in this multiverse. So I thank you for your time and I look forward to your additional questions and additional conversation. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm gonna admit it right here. I, I did watch all of Squid Games. <laughs> <laughs> And actually found that there was, you know, light that emanated from it at the end. But anyway, um, I, I, I think it's really interesting that you're talking about resilience through media and particularly because the last I don't know, one and a half, almost two years, it was in a sense, all we had. And um, I wonder what will happen as we move forward, will we continue to look to our screens as much as we did these past couple of years, do you think, to find our way, to find the stories that will lift us up? I do, I, you know, it's hard to predict what, what the platforms will look like, um, but I absolutely believe that storytelling will endure and that storytelling, as it's done historically, storytelling will help us regulate our emotions in this really connective way. And I will even, you know, this is the provocative piece. I'll even say that like, sometimes those stories and those characters are fictional and that's okay. Th those, those connections are not fake or delusional. Those connections can be really meaningful. You know how UCLA, um, I think more recently there's like a common book in a residential life yeah, but maybe we could have some, you know, a common like media experience that we could also, I mean, I know books are, are treasured items, but I love the idea of watching um, something all together and then using the space of, of being together to talk about it. I think you've really nailed one of the most helpful parts of this mediated resilience, um, especially through fictional story Th that one of the most, I think one of the most central things that come from that or can come from that is the resulting connections we have with one another, that it does form um, in many ways the space to talk of openly about issues that we may not be talking about, whether it's mental health, um, whether it's about well-being, um, it, it's, you know, surviving, that that's, that draws out the humanity in us. And then we're, you know, over the pandemic, We've been connecting so um, authentically over those stories. And it's not a replacement for therapy, right? Um, but I think that that can give people, I, I tell my clients like sometimes when we realize we love the same thing, um, it accelerates our relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful emotional uh, launching pad, right? Or, or starting point. Oh, I think it's sort of like sharing dreams together. Not, right. not really like, you know, good dreams, but just dreaming together. Mm. Thank you so much, Drea. Let, let's um, take a step forward um, into our future. Before we shift to a discussion amongst our guests, I'm delighted to share some of the work that's been made by our students. Um, tonight, we're particularly spotlighting the question, how do we fail? Um, 
And I'd like to suggest that the students recasting of failure in their projects is an excellent partner to this evening's project of sustaining. And I think you'll see why. Before I share these with you, know that the students were given the following prompt. Here it is. Write a collective message to your past selves about failure, ensuring that the components of this letter make use of organic materials. The first video you're going to see was made by three collaborators who realized after speaking with one another that they were all transfer students. They decided to write a collective letter to their past selves about the experience of failing to get into their school of choice their first time applying and the growth and learning that came from that. Here we go. Thank you for that message about sustaining. Uh, in this next project, you're looking at the image, students took a walk to UCLA's botanical gardens and made a mallet using sticks, rocks, and tree sap they found along the way. They used this instrument to break open a rotting pomegranate they found in the gardens. Their work reflects on how breaking through the decaying outer, outer layers of the fruit reveals new seeds and new beginnings inside. A lovely recasting of failure. Our third group of students burned leaves to create layers of ash, soil, and twigs. This process represented to them how layers of failure can become fertile ground for the next stage of life and learning. The students place flowers on top of the pile. And now you're looking at the final art piece. And in this last work this evening, another group video responds to the question, how do we fail?
Wow, isn't that just brilliant? Um, students, thank you for so much wisdom. Um, and to all the 10 question students for the work that you produce throughout the quarter. Questions are the very foundation of, the catalyst for creative and critical thinking. And in creating something that's never existed before collaboratively together, we can step outside of our ordinary quotidian lives to shift beyond who we thought we were and to discover who we can be. I take great pride in your work and I hope you do also. And I hope everyone here does. And my apologies for not being able to share more of it tonight. If you haven't already, please use that chat to let the students know how you feel about this work. So while you're taking in that work and sending it out back, we can see how the students re reinterpreted failure in a sense as part of the act of sustaining. I'd like to invite our guests back. Thank you for returning. Such incredible work, huh? Um, so um, actually, it, you know, in the spirit of the student work, I, I just like to start off our discussion by asking you in your field, in your work, do you encounter failure? And how do you sustain when things don't work out? I mean, working on climate change, we fail every day, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a dynamic I'm very familiar with. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump on you, Drea. And I'll just start by saying how much I enjoyed Arturo and Drea, both of your um, presentations you. and the things you shared, it was incredible. Um, I think it was Drea who said something that I have sort of always intellectually known, but have really begun to understand much more deeply since I've had children actually, which is that the it's not the failure that matters, it's, the, it's what you do next. It's like the response to the mistake or the response to the failure that really um, is a measure of your character and of your growth. And um, you know, that applies to mistakes you make interpersonally, but I also hope that it applies to the things we do professionally because you know, if we tried once and then, and then didn't solve the problem and then gave up, you know, we would not get very far. So I try to tell myself that it's really in the creative approaches to figuring out what to do next that the, that the trick lies. Well, maybe it's not a trick, maybe it's, it's actually everything. I have felt that um, it's quite the exercise to adjust to such constant everyday failure. Almost this idea that, um, you know, we should look at it like hardiness, not so much like failure, but this hardiness is this willingness to, to go into difficult situations and to know that not everything will be perfect. Um, I, you know, Kara, I, I, I think that, you know, I completely agree. There's this, there's this expectation almost that we'll encounter challenges and, and we're in fields that are from the beginning, from hour one, these fields ask us, solve these problems, right? Find a solution, fix this. And there should be, I think it's, it's, it's normal, absolutely normal to enter these fields and, and feel frustrated or unsure, uncertain and self-doubting. Um, but to know that that is a part of this journey and that it's the way in which we learn from the experiences that, that matter, that matters, um, and how we continue to go back to what is in our heart, right? Don't stray too far from that purpose and come back to who we are. It's funny because I have, I have such a different kind of, I'm not a scientist, you, you, you folks are scientists. Um, uh, you know, what, what I do, what I think the, the thing that, that, that uh, failure is, is actually the greatest thing in the world for a creative artist because, and it's, it comes down to employability, 
because if you want to be employed as, as an artist, as a composer, as a musician, whatever, you, you want to offer a product that no one else can get from anyone else. You know, they're going to call Arturo because, you know, he's going to come up with some crazy stuff. Um, and the only way to come up with crazy stuff is to eschew safety and to take big risks with what you're doing. And so when I sit down to write or compose or perform or create an organization or whatever I'm doing, I do it like I, I, can't, I can't afford to be afraid of what people will think. Because in my conviction, in my heart, in my integrity, I know that this is what is honest to me to do. And so it, 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 my failure doesn't necessarily result in the loss of human life, for instance, or in, in, in but, but, it, but it, it, it definitely, it definitely, I don't pander, I don't want to pander. And I don't want, I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be challenged every single day of my life. You know, and so that that kind of is where where, where I feel like without without uh, without failure, we're doomed to never move past a certain point. You know, we had a question that just popped up in the chat, which is sort of a question I wanted to. I'm going to share um, Jessica's question: Is how do you sustain everyday life in stressful environments? And I want to frame that also around. Um, well, maybe I'm trying to do too much here, but I'll throw it at you and you see what you, you grab. Um, I'm thinking about also how you um, manage sustaining in work and how it spills into your life, right? That each of you are so passionately engaged in the work you do. And so what, what happens, like how does sustain kind of move back and forth between the personal and the I guess we could say professional. Um, and then if, and then we'll come back to Jessica's question if you, if I usurped it. I don't, I gotta admit, I wanna be person, perfectly frank. I don't do a good job of balancing, uh, uh, sustaining a, a, a balance between my work and my personal life. I, I think I'm a good husband, a good father, a good person, all that stuff. But I tend to overdo it and I tend to, uh, I tend to really lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, it's not it's not what you achieve or what you do, but what what you bring to others. And and you can only bring to others if you if your plate is full. And I'm not talking about money or success. I'm talking about love, love and life. And that's 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 the thing you need to 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 kind of keep keep going with. I think I heard my wife say, "Yeah, he's not good at it." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I almost, you know, it's radical probably to say this, but I think this work-life balance idea is um, extinct um, because we can't mentally, it was a very high bar to begin with, this compartmentalizing of the self. And, you know, from the mental health perspective, the more holistic and connected we are, the more able we are to draw patterns and parallels. And I love Arturo, I'm gonna keep this in my pocket. Can You said connecting our convictions. I, that nails it for me, this idea that I've got to find meaning across these boundaries in order for me to sustain. Um, that, creates, uh, that creates this sort of self-compassion piece that creates this um, endurance. And I think it also creates that, that thing that I said, this, this purpose, this, you know, this big why. Um, and, and I think that when we loosen up that struggle to keep things so separate, um, we might find uh, some, uh, we might find that to be really reward, rewarding and less confining. I totally agree with that. And I feel like in the legal profession, it's rarer still than it should be to be able to be a whole person and a lawyer and a mom and all the other things that we are all together. Um, I was really very, very lucky because my very first job in the legal profession was at a law firm. And you guys imagine what a law firm is in your head. You've seen it on TV or maybe you've actually worked there. Um, pretty traditional work environment. But I was at a firm where my very first year as an associate, I happened to have an office next to a woman partner who 
had a baby and she decided to solve the conundrum of like how to do it all by bringing her baby to work every day. And so there was literally a crib in the office next to mine and she would do her very high powered, you know, partner lawyer calls with the baby in the background. Or sometimes I would go in and, you know, take the baby out if the baby was crying. It was all very integrated in a way that was especially rare 20 years ago, still rare today. But I think is key, and I, I don't think you mixed up too many different questions, Vic, by combining those two, because the answer for me to how to sustain every day in stressful environments is to allow myself to sort of be with and spend time with the things and people I, you know, I love the most and to be integrated in that way. Otherwise, it's like too hard. Mm. And, and I do, I love that. And I do have to add that, of course, there are differences in our experiences as we were specifically talking about our how we present at the workplace and maybe how we present in other, in other domains and social spheres. And that for some, the demand to present a certain way has more pressure um, that has to do with professionalism being so white centered, that has to do with um, gender norms, uh, that has to do with uh, gener intergenerational and ge generational expectations. Uh, I think during COVID, I've been so pleased to see some dismantling of those expectations. Um, and, you know, as a person who's still ac accepting a position of authority and a position of leadership, I, I have, um, I think, a responsibility to be as authentic as I can in embracing who I am as a woman of color or, or you know, as, um, as a leader who's a first gen student, you know, as somebody who, who is hopefully presenting myself in, a, in very authentic ways as a presenter, as a psychologist, as an advocate, um, so that the things that I felt uh, 20 years ago as a grad student um, in, my, in, in, in the depths of, the, of what, you know, we were talking about before, the self-doubting, the uncertainty, the imposter syndrome, that I'm not perpetuating those feelings. This is hopefully a direction that a lot of us can welcome. Speaking of imposter syndrome, um, I bet that the four of us here are not the only ones who have a little imposter syndrome. I bet there are others of us here this evening who maybe just time from time to time, moment to moment, may feel some of that. And I wonder, firstly, what is that? And also, what does that have to do with our ability to sustain? You know, wow, yeah. that's, a, that's OK, that's go a, for it. Good. I just want to say that so many of these things have such deep roots in socioeconomic realities. I have to say that, uh, you know, oh, yeah. oh my God, depending on what part of the neighborhood you live in, depending on who your people are and what they look like in relation to the rest of the populace, uh, those things are really like deep rooted. And, and so I think sometimes this imposter syndrome can come from a personal convoluted sense yourself. It can also be a, a, a condition of being othered by society for long enough that you just don't understand your place in it. I'm a musician and I still feel like the, there's somebody in the third row who's going to stand up and go, take him away, take him away. He doesn't know how to play. And, and, it, and it really does come from being, you know, the only Latino at conservatory when I was uh, six years old. And it comes from being, you know, a jazz musician in a classical conservatory and all the things that come with it. There's such, a, such so much packaging that you're given as you're training to, to your for your craft. Um, so at some point you have to go, I, I think what gave me license to stop it is to stop worrying about whether I was good enough or bad enough, because I'm not going to get better or worse in the next 10, five minutes, hour, hour and a half, two weeks, three months. It's not going to, I'm not going to all of a sudden, you know, grow credentials or, 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 or uh, I'm just not going to. So at this point, I figure that 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 whatever weaknesses I, I have as a scholar, as a musician, as an artist, they're there and they're on display and everybody can see them. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> that resonates so much. The, the, the feeling that you do not belong um, 
you know, in a situation or in a group or during, you know, even during a performance. And those feelings derive from a lot of places, right? Um, it can be almost conditioned, you know, when people continue to mispronounce your name or um, misspell your name, you know, I've, I've seen, I've had so many publications that actually my name is misspelled most of the time and it's become sort of a joke. Um, but that tells me folks aren't used to, to, to seeing me. Folks aren't used to me. People like me in the places that I end up. And it's both celebrated and also can be discouraging. Do, um, does it adds to the to the self doubt, right? Uh, should I be here? Was this a mistake? Did somebody get the numbers wrong in my application? Um, how did I slip through? And we can get fixated on that, right? But but I I think uh, it's an interaction between the self and and the social environment. And the way to combat it really is to celebrate what why we are there. Um, remind ourselves of our strengths and talents and look for our people. I, Arturo, it, it, like you, you named it, right? Like who is our community? Those are the folks that will not make you feel like an imposter. They, they say, come on in, we got you. We got you, you belong. And belongingness, you know, let me just say this. Um, if there's anything that folks remember in terms of mental health, belongingness is such an important component of our well being, so much so that thwarted belongingness is one of the biggest risk factors for loss of life due to mental health. Mm. Wow. That's incredibly powerful. I'll just, I really don't have that much to add. I'll just say, from my own perspective, I think one of the ways that I've learned to combat it is to name it. So I'm happy you asked the question, Vic. I was grateful, Drea, that you talked about it in your presentation. I think even just acknowledging that this is a thing that we feel that lots of people feel and we take it out of the shadow and we name it and we know that we share this feeling with other people helps me move past it a little bit. Like helps me to say, okay, it's there. I see it, I feel it. And I'm just gonna keep marching. <laughs> Yeah, I realized from what you're all saying is that it has so much to do with where the centers of power are. And if you're not part of those traditional centers of power, which might be white and male in an institution, um, or, you know, we can go all the way through it, cisgendered, heterosexual, all of those things, then, then part of the piece of that is that there's some part of me that doesn't belong here. And I, I, I am, a, I'm an imposter, but the exciting part that you're also talking about is the more that all of the imposters are present, the more we all belong for all the different reasons we bring to the table that Arturo said. Absolutely. Um, I, wanna, um, I wanna encourage students to offer more questions. Hayden, I think your question was very like the question that Jessica asked, so um, throw us another one. But while, while, we're, while we're in this moment together, a lot of you, a lot of you, a few of you, have spoken about purpose, like purposefulness, like when you find your purpose or um, that moment where, you know, for example, Arturo said the Grammy, it was a, you know, affirmation, but I found my purpose. Um, what does that mean? Um, um, purpose as a, a key to how you sustain. What does that mean? Um, that's, wow. I don't know if you can find your purpose so much as created. I, 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 I feel like you, I feel like you design through experience and through intuition what it is that you are what it is that you are meant to be and meant to do um uh, i don't know i think you also i know this sounds really pops pop psychology ish but you also create that you also create you find that you will create uh that 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 purpose uh, as you as you uh as as you uncover yourself you're gonna find out who you are and what you want to be and what your purpose is. Um, 
That's that's been my experience. Because yes, I wanted to be a musician. Then I wanted to be a well-known one. Then I wanted to be a successful one. Then I wanted to win awards. Then I wanted to be employed. And then, uh, and then at the end of the day, all I really wanted to do was put an alto saxophone in a young person's hand. Who would have known that 30 years ago, 40 years ago? So, you know, I, I did not, I, I, that, that was revealed to me and I fell into it and I created that purpose, I think. This is my question for you, Arturo, if it's okay for me to ask a question, Vic. Please. I, I wonder whether you sort of knew all along the path that that was what you wanted to do and you just had to convince yourself and it took a while to get there or was it revealed to you sort of later along your path? I'm that's, curious. That's, that's a great question. My mother was an art therapist in a nursing home and all I saw her do was invest in other people's well-being and all I saw her do was be kind and caring and loving. And so even though I wanted to play like Herbie Hancock, I, I didn't know that that part of her was in, was uh, invested in me. And, and so I think that maybe I did always know, but, but, but connecting the ability to play like a fine musician and seeing that part of my mother realized uh, is that that's, I guess maybe that, that, that that's really where, where it comes from. Can, and can I suggest to add to that too, that um, purpose is dynamic. And so, you know, as we go through these various milestones in our lives, sometimes we have those aha, what I call like aha Oprah moments, like, okay, it's so clear for me. This is where I belong this is what I should be doing. It's, I feel the groove, right? Uh, <laughs> right. And then there are other times when it's like, I've, and I've told to students this so many times during the pandemic, you know what, I'm, I sometimes feel adrift. I don't got it together right now. <laughs> what I would also say is um, embracing the, the dynamic aspects of purpose. Sometimes purpose can just be that day, right? Uh, earlier, Maria said in the chat, rest is right now resting is what I'm focusing on. Adam said, I got to get a degree. That's what I got to focus on. Stephanie said, I'm the first person to go to college in my family. That's what I'm focusing on. And I think that, um, you know, five years, that'll be different. Maybe in three years, it'll be different. In a month, it might be different. I'm, I'm embracing this idea. Let's re reframe that purpose so that it's, it, it can be just that day. I need to nourish my body. I need to get rest. I need to, I, I need to just take care of the self, right? And, and it can be at all levels. Um, that's sustainability. That all of that, that holistic perspective. Oh man, I love that because it releases one from the pressure of trying to find your single purpose in life as if there is only one, which is a lot of pressure. <laughs> it really yeah. is. But if I'm just waking up and thinking to myself, like, what do I need to do today? What am I passionate about today? What is the world, you know, what, what would be useful in the world today? I kind of like that question better than what is my single purpose, which feels a little overwhelming. Can I add one thing too? But there, there, there is something, there was two words bandied about here. One is purpose and the other one is intentionality. And I think that, that, that volition plays a large role in what you do and what you accomplish. And when you do something in an intentional manner, even if you don't realize it, or even if you don't think it's your purpose, you are creating purpose and you are creating a, a, a progression and you're creating a, a, a forward movement. And I think regardless of what you do, you must move forward. You must progress. You must go after what you need to do to sustain. That then No one can make that decision for you, but you. Thank you all for, for also reframing the question and so, so much wisdom here. Um, I I want to give Hayden, Hayden put a, a question in the Q&A. Um, I feel every time, Hayden, you put a question in, in the Q&A, in a sense, it's being discussed right then. But I want to I wanna put this out there. How do you try to reframe setbacks to help you sustain through difficulties? And if I could actually just frame that in, like, for example, in the last year and a half for you. I don't think Hayden's gonna love my answer. <laughs> I hope I, I hope I'm speaking to myself as I say this, but I think one of the ways to reframe setbacks is to 
look for the culpability you have in creating circumstances in your life that 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 set you back. Uh, we all do things that land us in, in 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 trouble or get us into a thick, you know. And and I think the first trick to forgiving yourself and others is to look for where you allowed that situation to happen. Look where where you landed yourself. And I think that's really important because you can't really reframe a setback that you didn't stumble into somehow. I mean, bad things happen that are arbitrary and, and random. But nonetheless, I would, I don't know about the percentage, but I would think about 65% of the issues I have faced, I've created inadvertently without trying to be, try, trying to shift. I mean, there's no percentage, but my point is that, you know, set uh, reframe a setback by finding out how you how you enabled it i think that's that would be my 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 immediate thought you know this really is a question about coping at least from my perspective um because what we're going to encounter setbacks pretty actually in the last year and a half pretty frequently um Daily. we've had some practice right um and and maybe look at it like that um knowing that this is one of, of many experiences that will feel like this. And I will say, let me just draw from the research that, that looks into um, what we can do from the psychological point of view. And it's, it, it really shows us that avoiding the feeling is, does us no good. That what we do need to do is approach the feeling that emerges from that setback or failure um, emotionally, we just need to get close to it and connect it. And the science behind that is that um, we have this kind of natural, uh, maybe there's a musical uh, metaphor for this, but like increases peaks and then kind of naturally dissipates, right? That, that actually is how our emotional being, our emotional um, mechanisms work. Maybe, you know, sort of like that, that curve. And a lot of times because it's painful, we stop we interrupt, we avoid, we run away, we distract, and we don't allow that emotion to reach its crescendo, its peak, right? Uh, and so then um, we don't get to experience what it's like to be calm to, 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 for that natural, you know, um, process of ourselves calming. And we can learn so much from that experience. And so the the suggestion then is try our best to sit with that emotion, to let that emotion happen and to really explore that, call it mindfulness, call it meditation, just call it a moment with yourself, self-awareness, self-forgiveness, but be close to it so that then that can help you move forward with what's next. And it always helps to take a walk among some trees too, if you can do that. <laughs> Um, before we, we bring this evening to a close, I want, I want to leave a moment for each of you, if you have something that you just feel needs to be said to, in order to create closure for yourself, um, please, let's just take a moment for your, for your final thoughts for tonight. I, I was going to, I was going to put this in the, in the, as a, as a question to the students. But I think it's it's my statement. I think that I would ask, do you dance spontaneously without music? Do you stop in the middle of your day? And because I, I find that I, I, I do this, I do this periodically, I'll stop and I'll just exult, enjoy. And I think that you have to be able to do that. Don't, don't take it so seriously. Spontaneously dance just for no reason, with no music, for no reason, with no music, for no reason, with no music. Just spontaneously dance as often as you can. I feel like this is Lord of the Rings and I'm offering a tool or um, gift for the next quest. Um, quickly, I will say, you know, I mentioned rest. Someone in the chat mentioned rest. Let me just say, um, you are worthy of rest. And so much in our culture tells us not to rest, um, especially it, many of our cultures here tonight. I grew up in a, in a culture that, um, uh, you know, added a lot of emotions like, you know, guilt and demands and other things to rest. I want to free you of those additional secondary emotions. Rest is 
is valuable. Rest does restore you. Rest does sustain you. And rest is radical. Rest is radical because you're pushing away from the demands and expectations and all those boxes that tell you you must do a certain thing. You are only in service. When we're resting, we're only in service to our well being. And it's pretty amazing. So that's it. I love that. I'll just, I'm just going to add some gratitude into the mix. I think I'm just going to add a simple thank you and say how grateful I am to have been included in this conversation. It's really rare, um, certainly at a university, but actually I think in life to be able to have a deep conversation like this with, you know, true experts from different fields talking about the same thing from very different perspectives. And I feel like I've learned so much. And so to the students who are still here, you know, know how lucky you are. I presume the semester has been full of fantastic conversations and I feel really lucky to have been part of this one tonight. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all. And I, I'm for myself, I feel so fortunate to be a part of this. Um, our students are extraordinary and they're gonna be talking to one another pretty much just after this is over tonight about this evening's discussion. So we'll bring it to a close here. Thank you all for being here with us tonight to consider how we sustain. This concludes this evening's program. We hope you'll join us again next week for our final question. How do we love? Same time, new link to RSVP, please visit arts.ucla.edu backslash 10 questions. Thank you and good night.